welcome to this short lecture on dyspnea. The learning outcomes for this lecture are number one, what is the definition of dyspnea? Number two, what are the mechanisms that cause and lead to dyspnea? And then finally, we focus on some common etiologies that present with dyspnea. How do these fit into the mechanisms of dyspnea? So let's first have a look at the board. So what have we got on the board? We've got the lungs in the background with the bronchial tree. In there, we've got the heart. We've got the aortic arch going up to the common carotid arteries. Over here, we've got the rib cage. So the rib cage. And there you can see in the, between the ribs, the intercostal muscles. And down here, we've got the diaphragm. And then up here, hopefully you can decipher my drawing and you can see it's the brain. And over here, we've got the etiologies, which are going to be broken into the cardiovascular causes, the pulmonary causes, and the neuromuscular causes. These aren't all of them, but these are the, the most common um, the co most common diseases that may present with dyspnea. So firstly, what is dyspnea? Now, many people will just say difficulty breathing or shortness of breath, but it's really a lot more than that. It's basically a symptom, not a sign. So the person will have to experience it. Now, the American thoracic society essentially would define it as a term used to characterize a subjective experience for the patient of breathing discomfort. Now that breathing discomfort is broken into kind of three areas. A, f a feeling of air hunger, so needing more, more air. Um, a, a, an increased drive in breathing, so working hard, working harder to breathe. And then finally, kind of like a chest tightness. So if you think of those three, that's essentially what the mechanisms that lead to dyspnea are. And we'll go through each one of those separately now. So I think what we'll start with is the drive, the increased drive or wanting to, to actually breathe, the force of breathing, the, the ventilation drive. So up here in the brain, you can see we've got a blue area and a red area. So the blue area here is what we're going to consider the primary motor cortex. So I'll just put a primary motor cortex here, which constitutes that part of the brain. Now, when you are breathing, this is going to be sending out an efferent signal going to, let's say, your respiratory muscles, that being your uh, intercostal muscles for either inspiration or expiration. So we do have an efferent output here. Okay, so we have an efferent flow, but we've also got some going from the brain stem, and that's going to be particularly for the most important muscle for breathing, the diaphragm. So this is going to be obviously the phrenic nerve going down to also give a motor drive. Now, before we finish up there, because that's fairly straightforward with a motor. Now, when you are breathing like so, there is a what we call a synergistic feedback loop. So there is going to be, with this outflow, a, a flow back to the sensory cortex. And that's going to tell the sensory cortex that your breathing force, your ventilation force has increased. So that's giving you an awareness that you are increasing your ventilation drive. Now, if that's when you're out running around a track, that would be okay and it wouldn't be a problem. But if you're sitting in bed or just sitting on a chair and you are starting to notice that you need to breathe more, this could be a reason for dyspnea. So that's the first one and that's the motor output based on those two. Some go into the intercostal and respiratory muscles, maybe also the neck, but also going down to the diaphragm, which is coming from the brainstem. So that's the motor and that's the ventilation drive. That's the first aspect. The second one we'll go to, um, we'll focus on, let's say, the chemoreceptors. So I'll write it here, chemoreceptors. Okay. And this is going to be dictating more what we call air hunger. So air hunger. And this is actually wanting to breathe more. You kind of, not, you feel like you're not getting enough air in. So firstly, with the chemoreceptors, we've got the peripheral chemoreceptors, which you have here in the aortic arch and the carotid body. So these two areas are sending a chemical um, stimulus back. And in most cases, being in the peripheral, it's going to be oxygen, so the PaO2, so the oxygen content, but also the PaCO2, so the, co the concentration of carbon dioxide. Now, this will be sent back to the brainstem, okay? And it's going to be pick 
picked up there, which is going to pick up that you are sensing that you need more air. And that's hence the air hunger. So that's the peripheral chemoreceptors, but you've also got central chemoreceptors, which are actually in the medulla. So these are central. And now these are picking up CSF, rather than these over here picking up blood. So this is picking up CSF, particularly for hydrogen and CO2. Now, if you were to have hypercapnia in this state, so increased CO2, you would probably have a direct air hunger experience. So you would directly feel like you need more air. So that would be directly dyspneic just by having high CO2 from the central receptors. Whereas if you had low O2 or high CO2 coming from the peripheral chemoreceptors, coming into the brainstem, it would probably just do a feedback loop and put it straight into the motor output, which would increase your ventilation drive and speed. But if that was the case, you would get that sensory going back up to the, the, the sensory cortex. I didn't put this in. Somatic sensory cortex, like so. And that would give you the sensation of dyspnea. So if it was coming from the peripheral and it was low oxygen or high CO2 from the peripheral, aortic arch or the carotid body, it would go into the brainstem, elicit a faster breathe, so a ventilation drive, which we did earlier. And that feedback would then go up to the, your sensory cortex, which you are now aware of. And that would feel um, that sensation of dyspnea. But if it was centrally driven, so you had um, increased hydrogen ions, so your pH dropped or your CO2 directly went up, you would get an instant reaction to dyspnea uh, independent of that feedback loop there. So that's the second one done and that's primarily air hunger. Now finally we go to um, mechanical stimulus. So I will do this one in black. So this is mechani mechano receptors. Okay. Now there are two types. There are those that are in the lungs, so we call them lung, and those that are in the chest wall. Okay, I'll do the chest wall first. So this is basically bringing proprioceptive feedback from the muscles in the chest wall. So they're intercostals, and this would be muscle spindles and Golgi apparatus, which is basically telling the stretch that's happening in your rib cage. Whereas in the lungs, the lungs have three kind of types of receptors. We have <clears throat> slowly adapting receptors, rapidly adapting receptors, and C fibers. Okay, so what these pick up, the, s the slow adapting receptors is basically telling your body the tension within your airway, so the kind of patency. Whereas the rapid adapting receptors, so these are constantly changing quickly, this is telling you kind of a feedback on your volume expansion of your lungs. And the C fibers are probably more to do with chemical stimulus and mechanical stimulus. So if it's a noxious and an irritating uh, uh, stimuli. Now together, these will go back. So this is a mechanical reception. And this is going to also go back into the brainstem. Now, depending on which one's coming from where, it would de determine whether it's the vagus nerve, so 10. You're also going to have someone up in the upper airway, which would be similar, and that will probably be glossopharyngeal, so that's 9. Okay. And the chest wall, probably somatic to a degree, with proprioception, so that's going up to there. But you're also going to have picked up in the somatic sensory cortex, which is going to give you that conscious, conscious feeling of that dyspnea. So hopefully now you've seen the three mechanisms of what could lead to dyspnea. Firstly, it's the increase in ventilation drive, which is either coming from the primary motor cortex or the brainstem going down into either diaphragm or the intercostals, but being picked up um, with a, a synergenic effect, which has gone to the somatosensory cortex, which is making you aware of your breathing. We've got... Um, <clears throat> the air hunger, okay, and which is going to be picked up either by the peripheral aortic arch or the carotid body going to the brainstem or centrally, which is in the medulla itself, and that gives you the sense of air hunger, also part of dyspnea, or in the mechanical reception, 
Now, if these are picked up, <clears throat> it's probably going to give you a sensation of chest tightness. Which is still a phenotype of dyspnea. So all these three together will give the sensation of dyspnea. Okay, so hopefully you now are understanding the mechanisms that are fitting in with dyspnea. Now moving across to here, we'll finish on the etiologies. So the common etiologies in the cardiovascular system would be congestive heart failure or anemia. For the pulmonary, <clears throat> the best way I can remember it are the five P's. COPD and asthma and then neuromuscular this is basically anything that's going to affect the way that the muscles are told to work so <clears throat> this could be deconditioning any kind of muscle disturbance or neurological disturbance even obesity now, how do these fit in? Firstly, with congestive heart failure, basically there's probably a number of things that could be going on here. So, <clears throat> one of the things that congestive heart failure will lead to is edema, interstitial edema within your lungs, because the heart's not beating well, fluid's going back into the atria and then going out into the lungs. So where you have it out in the lung tissue, that's going to affect the way that the lung expands and that's going to probably give you a mechanical reception change and that's going to give you a sensation of chest tightness. So that's probably one aspect of where congestive heart failure fits in. Also with congestive heart failure, you probably do have a drop in O2 in your blood, which fits into there, going back into your brainstem and then giving you that air hunger feeling with congestive heart failure. With anemia, probably a couple of things. Firstly, with anemia, you're going to have a drop in O2. You probably counteract it with breathing quicker. So you might get a change in your pH, which would give you a change in the central chemoreception. But also with the anemia, you're probably going to get an increase in heart rate. So your heart's beating quicker. That means less emptying, increased in diastolic volume. Also going back into the right atria, left atria, and then that going back in the lung and giving you interstitial edema. Going across into the pulmonary, now into the terms of the five P's, <clears throat> all the five P's basically fit in within the mechanical re reception issue. So the five P's are a PE, pleurisy, pulmonary cancer, pulmonary fibrosis and pleurisy. So this is essentially affecting the, the way that lung is expanding or the irritation associated with. So with pleurisy, um, certain types of cancers that would be located around and that would cause irritation. Pulmonary fibrosis within the lung tissue would it change the, its compliance and the way it's expanding. Similar with um, pneumonia that would fit in in the same mechanism. Now in terms of COPD, big ones with COPD is a drop in O2 and an increase in CO2. So that would be a combination of peripheral chemoreception and central chemoreception but also you've got changes with the lung compliance and its resistance, and that would probably also give you a mechanical reception issue with the dyspnea. In terms of the asthma, asthma you've got bronchoconstriction through the lungs, so that's gonna make it harder for the air to come through, which is the way that the ventilation, so the ventilation, the ventilation drive is getting pushed against the narrow airway, and that's gonna be a feedback issue with the um, the motive component but also you've got a whole lot of irritation within your lung with asthma and that would probably be with more of the C fibers and the chemical mediators that are released with asthma finally we go to the neuromuscular effects so this is just the way that the chest wall is responding to the drive it gives it so if you've got problems with your muscles so you're deconditioned and your muscles are weak or the nerves that are going to it, or the, just the chest wall, the person's obese, so the ability to push the diaphragm down is resistant, resisted against the, the obesity. This feedback against the efferent drive is going to be um, 
mismanaged and that's going to give more of a chest wall mechanical reception dyspnea. So that's the main etiology that you can see with dyspnea. So hopefully that has helped. Sorry for my voice, I've lost it halfway through. Um, <clears throat> hopefully now you know what dyspnea is. You know the three main broad mechanisms that will cause it. And now you can see the most common etiologies that will cause dyspnea and how they fit into that mechanism.